Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us on this Friday evening to attend and um, listen to our webinar on IVF with donor eggs. So I'd like to first of all introduce this evening's esteemed panel. We have Dr. Giza Venka, who's the director and medical director of the clinic, Ms. Darshi Karuba, who's the head of egg donation at the clinic, and Mrs. Bijal Gill, who's one of our patient coordinators. So what are we going to cover this evening? First, we'll have the introduction to IVF with donor eggs and then a little bit about how to choose your donor and both of those topics will be covered by Dr. Venkat. Then we will discuss donor anonymity, legal parenthood and other sort of frequently asked questions that relate to egg donation in the UK, which I will cover myself. And then we will discuss the role of counselling and the actual treatment pathway, which Darshi will cover for us. And last but not least, Bijal will cover some further resources that you may wish to take a look at and the practical steps to get going with this treatment. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Venkat to talk about IVF with donor eggs. Thank you, Suve. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for spending your evening. We will have an informative session about this IVF with the donor eggs. It is actually a complex subject. However, we try to make it as simple as possible. And uh, this is one of the topics which is close to my heart. And uh, we always work hard to find the road, right donor for every woman, because this is such an important thing in their life. Okay. And, uh, you know, it happens, uh, you know, people usually don't plan for donor egg treatment in the sense, look, everybody will think that, okay, when the time is right, when I found Mr. Right, when we are settled in life, we will have a baby. And if it doesn't happen, then people will go for IVF. But this is the situation where there are not enough eggs or good quality eggs. And that's what it is. So why we need donor eggs when the ovarian reserve is low, that means not enough eggs, the ovaries are not working well, or we do not have good quality eggs, or sometimes the IVF has failed many times and no point in repeating with poor quality and uh, poor grade embryos. Sometimes to avoid any inherited diseases, this is the uh, egg donation is used. Having said that, this was more commonly used in the olden days, but now we do what is called reimplantation genetic testing to avoid those defects and not only genetic testing, it's both chromosomal abnormalities, also single gene defects. So we can identify some particular diseases so we can avoid inheritable conditions. We try to do it without going for donor eggs, but some cases it's not possible then we go for donor eggs. And if the ovaries are damaged, or in some cases they are removed for cancer and other conditions. Lastly, there are cases where women are born without ovaries or streak ovaries. That means there are no eggs. One of the commonest conditions we come across in the clinics is Turner's syndrome. The women are born with streak ovaries. And we have had few cases where we have made babies for such women. Okay, so as I said, the egg donation is a complex treatment because it involves three, three people. One is the egg donor. Second one is the woman receiving the eggs and the partner of the woman who gives the sperm. So there are three people involved. And first is, step is the stimulation of the egg donor. Actually, before that, we select the donor and we, that is matching of the donor and the recipient. Next step is the synchronization of the cycle and the donor undergoes ovarian stimulation. This is the most difficult part uh, because the donors have to be committed. They have to have all the tests first and have injections for 12 days, like a woman going through IVF and they have to undergo a procedure that is collecting the eggs or removal of the eggs. Of course, with anesthesia, but still they have to undergo a procedure. That means the donor must have 
lot of commitments to this egg donation. Otherwise, most of them will pull through halfway during the treatment. So that part is done by the donor. And at the same time, what happens is the egg recipient or the woman who is receiving the eggs and the embryo basically will be prepared for the embryo transfer. So she will be given estrogen tablets to develop the lining of the womb. So when the donor is ready to give her eggs, the recipient will be ready to receive the embryos. The donor eggs will be mixed with the partner sperm and embryos will be created and grown in the laboratory and transferred. Now, that's what it is written here. You can see it is embryos are created using donor eggs and the partner sperm, or sometimes it will be used donor sperm also. If the woman is a single woman or uh, they are in same-sex relationship, in which case we use donor sperm as well. And the, once the embryo is created, the embryos are grown in the lab up to the fifth day because the embryos reach a highly developed stage called blastocyst stage. This has got the highest implantation potential. Therefore, we'd like to put the embryos back into the womb at this stage to give you the best chance of success. And the whole treatment takes something like two and a half to three weeks. And then the woman does the pregnancy test 10 weeks later to see if the treatment has been successful. This is the whole gist of the treatment. Now, coming to the important question of how do we choose the donor? Yeah, the donors can be anonymous or known donors. Now you can see in the picture, we have a donor who's entering our clinic. She did a few donations and made some babies for our patients and uh, Actually, when she heard the news, she had tears in her eyes because it was such an emotional moment, both for the donor as well as for the recipient. Now, coming back to the subject, that is, if you have a sister or a friend who can help you, that is called known donation. Family members and friends can help us, donors. But there are different reasons for doing that because if you want to know the gene, that is the gene pool of the donor, then it's better to bring a known donor like sister because sisters share the genes. Or if you have a friend, you know about her, you know how the child is going to be, then you can bring a known donor. But it has its issues as well. But other preferred route is anonymous donation because you don't want to see the donor and you don't want her involvement in, in seeing the child later on in life and causing issues. That's why anonymous is preferred by many. That is the most commonly used route of donation in the UK. Among the anonymous donations, there are three types. We have altruistic egg donors, where the woman comes out of the goodness of her heart and donates her eggs. She, these such women are amazing women. I have seen it. They have to come to the clinic so many times, have blood tests, have injections. In fact, our IVF patients sometimes find it difficult to do the injection and say, oh my God, do I have to do the injection? Do I really need, need to do this? But these girls, young girls come and have the injection, have their collection and donate eggs for somebody they don't even know. That is such an amazing thing. And we have to admire such women and they do it. These are altruistic egg donors. Till a few years ago, they were not paid or anything. They just had that uh, travel you know, expenses reimbursed. But recently, HFE has introduced a new regulation whereby the donors can be given a total lump sum of 750 pounds for their kind act. Now, the next type of donation is called egg share donation. Here, the woman undergoes IVF for her own self. And during the IVF treatment, she gives away 50% uh, of her eggs for donation and she gets some compensation re return for her kind act. Then the next question which comes to everybody's mind is if she herself needs IVF, how can she donate eggs? It will not be good. No, here we select the donors. Not everybody is suitable to have egg, to be an egg share donor. The woman has to be under 35, fulfill all the characteristics for an egg donor, like non-smoker, body weight should be less than this, 
and you know, should not have any inheritable diseases, mentally stable. But the other condition also, she should have enough eggs. And she should not have any problem with her hormones or egg number or quality of the eggs. In such cases, usually the issue is with the man. He's got low sperm count or no sperm at all, in which case when they undergo IVF treatment, the woman is able to donate half of her eggs. And she does the kind act when she has the treatment herself. So she does not have to do this stimulation for somebody else. She's doing it for herself, herself and helping another person in the same process. So that is the second kind of donation. The only difference here is you will have reduced number of eggs because she's keeping half and she's giving you half. Whereas in the altruistic egg donation, you will get something like we will promise you eight to 10 eggs or five to 10 eggs. And you, if you want more eggs, you can get it. If she produces more eggs, you can have more eggs. So that is the difference between these two. And the third option, obviously, we have egg bank where the eggs are frozen. Here, when the donors come and if the recipient is not ready or not suitable, then we freeze the eggs. And I'm happy to say in HSFC, that is Holly Street Fertility Clinic, we have something like 1,500 eggs frozen. We have different kinds of donors like uh, Caucasian donors, European donors, Asian donors, and uh, Afro-Caribbean donors. And, uh, oriental mixed race donors. So we have a variety of donors and we will be releasing the catalog in the next few months. Then you will be able to look at it on the website and choose the donor from the website. Okay, then if you ask me, who will uh, you accept as a donor? Are there any criteria? How do I know that my donor is a healthy person? All the recipients ask this question to me. And uh, are you sure that she does not have any diseases? So they have to go through some processes. They'll come for consultation and we make sure that that woman is aged between 18 to 35, no significant medical history. That is particularly the doctor's job. We take a detailed history to find out if there is any medical problems or issues in herself or in her family. She should be a non-smoker and she should be fit and healthy. BMI should be under 30. Now this issue is becoming very difficult these days as the general population's BMI is going to the right side. The donor's BMI also is increasing and some of them we have to ask them to lose weight. Then only we accept them. And there should not be any personal family history of inherited diseases, which I mentioned to you earlier, and no history of mental diseases. You might ask me how you sort of find out about all these things. Who is going to tell me that, look, my mother had schizophrenia or there is history of bipolar in my family? Nobody will tell us. But what we do is we ask them to fill a questionnaire with all different types of illnesses and which could be transmitted, which are called inheritable diseases. And we ask them to complete the form that is the health questionnaire and ask the uh, questionnaire to be countersigned by the GP. So the GPs will know the family history and they will not just blindly sign this form. So that, that makes sure that the donor does not hide anything from us. So we know that there is no psychiatric or mental illnesses in our family. And First step we do is to do a test to make sure she has got enough eggs. Only then she will be accepted as an egg donor to start with. Then only we go through all this history to say whether she has any problems. And we also take history of any infectious diseases in herself in the past, also sexually transmitted diseases. And we also do a detailed blood test to check for all the infectious diseases like HIV, hepatitis B, syphilis. And now there are so many diseases coming, you know, HTLV. Uh, we had Zika a few years ago, Ebola. And now we added to the list is the COVID-19. So we are, we are checking the donors even for that. If they have that, they can't be taking part in the egg donation program at all. Okay, so I'm making it clear the donors have to be healthy. and. Preferably, if they had a child, it's better. 
but some of these young girls do not have I mean they don't even have a stable partner so they don't have any children so that doesn't mean they disqualify but if they have a child it's they have proven fertility it's better or if they have donated to somebody if that person has become pregnant that donor has got proven fertility i think it will be a good idea to choose such a donor right so now important thing is all the recipients ask me how do we choose the donor doctor we ask them to fill a form to say what characteristics are you looking for in the donor and what characteristics are your characteristics and your family or partner's characteristics basically we match the donor and recipients by the physical characteristics like height weight uh, skin color eye color hair color these kind of things why do we do that that is because we want the child to belong to the family otherwise if we give you somebody who's totally uh, outside your family characteristics then when you have the child grows up everybody will look at the child and say where did this child come from he or she looks so different from the parents so we don't want that we don't want you to have some stigma at the same time we don't want the child to be suffering as well because we take into account the welfare of the child child should have a normal life okay therefore we say we want the child to look like the mother and father so we find the egg donor who looks like the recipient as much as possible and some people tell me i remember, i mean we have done this for so many years they say oh doctor i will only have somebody who has got hazel eyes i'm very particular because in my family everybody has green and hazel eyes i my donor must have hazel eyes okay and we have had patients who rejected donors because she was 2 cm 2 cm or 2 inch shorter than she wanted she wanted somebody who was more than 160 cm taller but the donor we offered was 155 cm i can't you know like if you you want to have everything in the donor like blue eye blonde hair this height that this thing skin tone no freckles this i think you will be waiting forever the most important thing i always tell them look what is the use of choosing somebody who has got all this blue eye blonde hair and uh, you know 170 cm and tall girl beautiful girl everything at the end if she doesn't give you a baby what is the use of all those characteristics absolutely useless the most important thing you should look for is because you want a baby out of this treatment so the choose a donor of course we will make sure she is a healthy donor so you have a healthy child choose a donor who has had fertility or proven fertility in the past and if you are easy with the characters the characteristics little bit is is we are we are able to find the donor sooner for you and i i don't mean you take anybody and everybody i'm not saying that at all you say look i would prefer you know dark hair and uh, either blue or brown you know eyes or whatever but if you say this is very important to me okay we'll try to find a donor with that characteristic but important thing should be a fertile donor who is going to give you a baby you want to get pregnant in the first attempt and go home with a healthy baby this characteristics are all little bit you know the next step first priority should be a proven fertility donor that's what i will attach importance for that's what it says here choosing a donor keep in mind proven fertility is an advantage i will say it is your priority if you want to get pregnant in the first attempt that's what it is needed for successful treatment and next healthy baby so this is more important in a donor rather than the height weight or whatever it is okay but at the end of the day each person is different not every i can't expect everybody to say this is the important thing because we are all doctors we say that it's easy for us to say probably but please keep this in mind when choosing a donor okay so here now i think i will have to hand over to you okay thank you very much dr venkat
So now that brings us very nicely on to donor an anonymity. So we get this question a lot. Can the donor find out about us? Or, you know, can my child who's born from this treatment also find out? So the regulations in this country, which is set by the HFEA as a part of the HFE Act, say that children born from donation have the right to learn the identity of their donor when they turn 18. And they can request this information from the regulator, the HFEA. Children born from donation may also request identifying information about donor-conceived genetic siblings with mutual consent when they turn 18. However, it's always up to the parents to actually inform the child in the first place. Because, you know, if a child doesn't actually ever ask the question, who are my parents, they're not likely to, because they're your child, then this sort of never you think to okay, tell them. However, there have been some large studies that show that these things have a habit of coming out at some point. And if you lead the conversation and are open and transparent with your child earlier in life, then they tend to have better outcomes than if you were to wait and hide the information because then at some point it comes out and it can come out, sorry, please pardon me. It can come out rather unpleasantly during a family argument or something similar. And that's not good for anyone and it's particularly traumatic for the child. So we always advocate openness and transparency. Now the legal situation is that donors simply aren't the legal parents. They relinquish all rights and responsibilities when they donate their eggs or sperm. Um, so the donor cannot claim any right over the child, and similarly, the child or the parents cannot claim any right over the donor. Um, the only, and donors can't be held responsible for their donation. The only exception is if a donor knowingly withheld a certain illness or disease or genetic condition that is transmittable, and they withheld it intentionally from the clinic or the couple who are receiving the eggs or the sperm. Um, and in that case, then the donor can be held responsible and you can sue for damages. But the main point here is that donors simply aren't the legal parents and they have no rights or responsibilities towards the child. So this is a list of the most common questions that we get, and I think I answered number one already, sorry. <laughs> Will a donor be held responsible if the child is disabled? So Generally, the answer is no, but there is an exception, which is yes, they will be held responsible if they were aware of the disease and failed to disclose it at the time of donation. Can donors change their minds? Yes, donors can, change, can withdraw or vary their consent at any time until the embryo is transferred. Now, this is very important because some of our couples will have embryos created and freeze them and then have them transferred later and actually the donor can change or withdraw their consent at any point until that embryo is actually transferred into the recipient. How many times can a person donate? So a donor can donate and create up to 10 families by law in the UK. However, as a clinic, we like to try and stick to a lower limit of six families because one, they might go off to have some families or a family or families of their own, and they might go abroad or elsewhere to donate, and we might not be aware of it. See, all clinics in the UK report donations to the regulator, so we keep a sort of central register and we know how many, time, how many families have been created by a single donor, but that doesn't apply abroad. And of course, you know, these days people travel a lot, and so we try and stick to a lower limit. What do they find out about their donation? So donors can find out the outcome and the number of children born and the sex and the year of birth. So for any donation, they can always find out, find out what happened essentially. And Dr. Venkat covered this, can a donor be paid? No, a donor cannot be paid. However, egg donors can be compensated up to 750 pounds per donation cycle. 
do we have a lot of donors? We do actually, we're quite fortunate being a clinic located in a very cosmopolitan city and with a very well-educated population. We have a good selection of donors and the waiting time is almost nil, particularly with the development of our egg bank. So if you want a fresh donor, generally the wait time is under three months. During that time, we will do your workup. So actually you won't have any extra wait time, but if you're using frozen eggs, the wait time is pretty much zero. It's just however long it takes us to prepare you for treatment. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, um, Darshi, who's gonna talk about implications counseling. Thank you, Darshi. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, everyone, my name is Dashi. I'll just go through the implication counseling slides. So as you can see, egg donation, it's complex treatment, it's because there are another person involved compared to a normal IVF. That's a simple step as why it's so complex. But again, choosing a donor, as Dr. Venkat mentioned, choosing a donor, how it goes further, it would be a little bit different. So I will go through these steps, what are involved in the implication counseling, because counseling is very, very important when you go through the egg donation or any donations involved in, in terms of fertility. Each patient and couples are unique. They may have different, different um, circumstances. Therefore, we will go through the implication counseling. Now, counseling, what it should be involved or what we do in the implication counseling. So each, as I said, each individual may have certain concerns, including their fears and everything. And you may have a friend who had gone through a bad experience, or you may have somebody had a good experience. So different people come from different backgrounds and varieties. And the understanding of the egg donation is maybe different. So you will be meeting counselor who will go through all these questionnaires because you may have a doctor who go through the clinical questions and everything, but it's all about emotional and personally how you felt and connected. So the counselor will go through that. And also she will also ensure that what are the implications involved when you're doing the counseling, uh, when you're going through the donor -like treatment. She will do the similar to the donor, as same thing to you. So you need to understand, like so we have mentioned about anonymity. She will say how you feel about, how you, when do you want to tell the child? Sometimes people have a question, or oh, do I have to tell the child? What's the age, right age to tell the child? So all these things the counselor will can go through. And it is also like, um, like I mentioned, the non-clinical questions as well. Now, this is the important part where so you all might wondering, so how we start and how we ending, happy ending. We will start with the initial consultation first and we are Dr. Wingat will go through, understand your circumstances and what are the things you have done so far. According to that, we will do certain things. And then step two is the initial test. So we need to go through the semen analysis. So the male has to go to semen analysis to make sure there's a sperm there so that we are cover on that side. And the, uh, the female wise, we wanted to do certain blood test to match you with the donor. So we just go through those tests. And also we will do the initial assessment on the scan to see is there anything need to be done before we go through the treatment. Then the next step is the implication counseling. So by this time, you will be having all the clinical understanding and everything and about yourself. Now you are moving to the implication to preparing, mentally preparing yourself. Then we go to the third step is where now you will have an idea what kind of donor characteristic you need. So it's all about the ethnic origin, the high eye color, hair color, skin color, blood test, uh, blood group, and uh, certain things. So you will write that down about yourself in the one page. The other page are all about which are the donors. Yes, you have a brown eye, but you don't have, my grandmother had a hazel eye, so you don't mind having that. So these are the other requests which you can mention it there. Then we go through the mock cycle. So mock cycle is about, like Dr. Wengen Dr. mentioned earlier, we will prepare your endometrium for your actual embryo transfer. But we are doing a mock so that we know how you will respond in the actual treatment. So that if there are any difficulties we have building your any of these things, then we can figure out now and we can 
fix it now rather than the actual treatment because you may may not will be synchronized with the donor so you might need this now we have done all the necessary step everything there you go we are matching you with the donor so i have your list and we will go through our donor bank either fresh or frozen we will go through that and we will see okay here are the donor profiles it will include height weight body color hair color ethnic origin and some they put about religions and their occupations and stuff like that so you will have those things you will choose your donor that's important because we will give you the donor but you need to say yes i'm happy with the donor or i'm not happy with the donor so we are not um, implying on you so you will choose the donor and the other step is pre-treatment screening so we have to do the infection screening as we are regulated by the hfea the government body so we have the screening test what is needed to be done all this hepatitis b b pro c hiv1 and 2 certain tests we have to do so you will do all the screening and now if you are synchronizing you with the donor so we need to synchronize your cycle with the donor cycle if you are not if you are going for a frozen cycle then the synchronization may not apply to you and then we do starting the treatment there you go you have your period or we will have your preparation endometrial preparation once you are ready in your preparation then we will get the eggs a collection from the donor or throwing the eggs from the freezing part and we will throw the eggs and fertilization then we will do the culture if it's needed and everything finally we will have a nice good looking embryos then we will transfer into you from the transfer normally 10 days time you will be able to do a blood test to see whether you have a great news about you are getting pregnant so you are pregnant or not and then uh, from there in another three weeks time you will have a ultrasound scan and you will see your baby heartbeat and a tiny weeny if like a peanut size you will see the baby how it's looking and then happy ending you will be soon deliver the baby as normal that's it that's it now i think i will hand over to Pijal. i think next slide Thank you, Darshi. Good evening, everyone. As Darshi has just mentioned, my name is Bijal Gill and I'm a patient coordinator. I may have spoken to some of you already, and if I haven't, I definitely look forward to doing so. IVF using donor eggs is a big decision, and I'm sure that some of you have been thinking about this for some time before getting in touch with us and joining us today. It's natural to have lots of questions, and that's what our donation team is there for, to help and support you through this. Many of you will be familiar. It's a place that answers some of your queries. It's our HSFC website. The Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, the HFEA, are the government regulator for making sure all fertility clinics comply with the law. Again, their website is very informative. British Infertility Counseling Association, BICA. All of our counselors, counselors sorry, are members of BICA, and it is the only one recognized by HFEA. And as Darcy has mentioned, that's a very important part of your treatment. National Gametes Donation Trust and Donor Conception Network are both charity organizations that um, they basically provide supportive networks for clinics and families with children conceived using donors and for those considering it as well. Egg donation is very positive and it's amazing that it can give women the opportunity to conceive where they would have faced some difficulties in the past or, you know, for the other reasons that Dr. Mench um, Dr. Venkat sorry, mentioned previously. To start your journey, we can help to arrange a consultation, the initial test as well. And all you would need to do is to give us a call or email us to get in touch and we can get this booked in for you. We do consultations at varied times throughout the week to make it easier for you. Next, we have a short video of the journey of one of our patients, Eleanor.
My name is Elena Stoyanova. I went to a clinic close to where I live, but the doctor over there was very dismissive. So she called me over the phone to let me know that I can't have kids. So that, that was unacceptable, especially for a person who has been trying for a few years. friends. They gave us the details for Dr. Venkat. I phoned, we came, we did tests and unfortunately she gave me the news that I can't get pregnant biologically because I didn't have many eggs left and I was in maybe menopausal, my blood levels were too high, obviously I was upset, I was angry. She did tell me what my options were but I didn't want to hear. So in a week's time after she's given me the results, out um, we decided to go for donor eggs and um, we came back and we started the process I was ready my organism was ready they filled me up with everything <laughs> um, so basically I was ready in July um, and she said that we can start the process, but we wanted to travel <laughs> in Europe <laughs> by car. So we said, can we start in September because we're going on holiday. <laughs> um, so she was a bit surprised, <laughs> but we, you know, we, we, we did take the holiday. We came back in September. Um, obviously the process started. I was pregnant in October and then I bled and then I called her emergency and I came in, and came in the morning and she said it's two things. It's either bad news or it's twins and it was twins. <laughs> And they actually looked after me until I think the last drip on a special drip um, that boosted up the embryo's um, immunity uh, because my body seemed to kill um, antibodies or other bodies. So they treated me until I was six months. So they looked after me until I was six months into pregnancy. And yeah, the result. <laughs> I, I did ask, is it possible if we do the fertilization and obviously your organism changes, the whole thing changes, is it possible that I may get pregnant? Naturally, and Dr. Venkat went, only God knows. So we never actually, because we haven't been using any protection for, well, my daughter is eight now, since she was three years old. So, you know, that's quite a long time. That's five years. We never actually used any protection because we never expected. I mean, we went through all of the IVF, donor eggs and everything. So who would who'd expect? And then last night I did the tests and they showed <laughs> positive pregnancy. So I'm here today for a blood test. So maybe this one will be a result of whatever treatment they gave me as well. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's the story. <laughs> This pregnancy gives me a bit of mixed feelings because I, I'm worried if I will have time for all the kids. The whole team's always been very nice and very supportive. So, because I wasn't exactly the calmest of patients, like I was. <laughs> so, um, Marianne was, was one of them. Obviously, she's mature, so she can calm people down when they are a bit over the top hormonal. <laughs> Marion is great. I'm not blonde originally. Um, and I said, I want to dye my hair. And she went, oh, my darling, you can't. And I went, what do you mean? She went, no, peroxide will kill the baby. And I went, what do you mean? I can't dye my hair, so what am I going to do? Shall I shave it off? She laughed so much. <laughs> she laughed so much. You know, she went, you're so funny. I went, I'm not feeling funny. I want to dye my hair. <laughs> So 
that's why she's never going to forget this, because she always, when she sees me, this is what she's thinking about, the lady that wants to shave her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Venkat is great like from day one. She's always been honest. Um, she never um, hid anything from me. She's given me the facts. And obviously, um, thank you. I, I can't say anything else. Thank you. Gratitude. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, she gave us a miracle, and there's another miracle in me now. So what, what, what more can you say? to a person that gives you this miracle. Few miracles, three miracles. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Thank you all very much for your listening attentively. Um, we will now happily take any questions that you may have. We've already received a few. Um, please use the questions box to submit your questions and we'll take them as we receive them. But first, I would like to just thank Eleanor. I know she's not here, but it was very, it's always nice to hear the patient's side of the story. And I think that's always the most powerful thing that you can hear about this treatment. So the first question that we have is how many embryos are you able to transfer? So in the UK, we are allowed to transfer up to two embryos for anyone where the egg provider is under the age of 40. Now, if the egg provider is over the age of 40, we can transfer up to three embryos. Now, ideally, we want everyone to have a nice, healthy, singleton pregnancy because that's the least risky but we can transfer up to two embryos and that does increase the chance of success with the treatment, but it also increases the risk of multiple pregnancy. Next question is how large is your donor database? So I'm actually gonna hand this over to Dr. Venka because I'm not the best person to ask. Okay, that's a good question. It is the part to know the list of how many donors we have and what is the database. So we have a database of like 1,500 donors, donor eggs in our egg bank. And uh, when we say 1,500, we have a variety of donors, like I mentioned before in my speech presentation, sorry. That is, uh, we have Caucasian donors, and the Asian donors, Afro-Caribbean donors, mixed race donors, as well as Oriental donors. And so different kinds of donors we have. And that is the important thing. Other clinics, I know they have a lot of Caucasian donors. However, many clinics don't have ethnic minority donors at all. And we get referrals from other IVF clinics for these ethnic minority donors. Somehow we are fortunate to have, with God's grace, that we have this uh, ethnic minority donors here. And uh, I'm happy to also say that we have a lot of professionals coming and donating in our clinic. We have lots of doctors who have donated. We have lots of nurses, healthcare assistants, and uh, this kind of uh, accountants, they have come and donated. And uh, that means well-educated people, they come and they want to do this to help other women in community. They say that, you know, community helped me in some way to come up in life. I want to return to the community. They come and donate. So we have really a good database of, I would say a database of good donors in quality, like ethnic minority in all types, as well as and good quality eggs also. That is more important, like I mentioned. These women have had children or have made women pregnant by their eggs before. So good quality eggs as well. On the whole, it's a good uh, database of consisting of useful and helpful donors.
The next question is approximately how long does it take to find a donor? So I think we did cover this in the slides, but essentially these days it doesn't take very long. One, because we have a readily available bank of frozen donor eggs and it has a large selection of donors. And the other is, like I said, we, we're fortunate to work in a very cosmopolitan city with lots of sort of uh, aware people who you know, are aware of this need for donors and they do come forward and it doesn't take us very long to match a recipient so on average we're looking at a waiting time for a fresh donor of around three months or less however if you are extremely particular and you ask us to find you know someone who is argentinian and six foot tall and hazel-eyed and blonde haired it might take a while longer the next question that we have is what are your success rates fresh versus frozen eggs. I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Venkat, if you don't mind. Yes, this question comes to a lot of people's mind because there is a general belief that uh, frozen eggs have a lower success rate. That is to certain extent true because if you compare fresh eggs versus frozen eggs with equal number of eggs, then the, when we take the frozen eggs out, you lose some eggs. Therefore, the success rate goes down. Whereas with fresh eggs, you don't lose any eggs by, by fertilizing them fresh. That's why the success rate is slightly lower because you lose, the, lose some eggs and the number goes down. What we do in our clinic, because we always want the best success rate for our patients, I would like all my patients to get pregnant in their first attempt. That's what we try aim for, we try to do it. But it doesn't happen in everyone, but it happens in the majority of the people. And uh, so what we do to compensate for the losing number with frozen eggs, we give a higher number of frozen eggs. So we always guarantee eight to 10 frozen eggs whenever we offer you frozen eggs. Whereas with fresh eggs, we might be able to get away with five eggs or six eggs. Because if we take out eight frozen eggs, we might lose one or two, we end up with six. Therefore, if we give you fresh six eggs, that will be fine. Whereas frozen eggs, we have to give you eight to 10. We always make sure we give at least eight, try to give you 10 to compensate. Therefore, your success rate will be the same as the fresh eggs. I hope that answers your doubt in your mind or the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very informative. The next question we have is the what is the age limit for this treatment? Again, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Venkat. Okay, so the age limit is a, in a difficult or tricky question, I would say, because our clinic normally treats women up to the age of the 51st birthday. Therefore, you can have treatment using donor eggs up to that age. Anybody over that age, we have certain formalities. That means we request the couple or the woman to see the counselor and understand the supportive network she has so that we make sure that the child is looked after in case of any issues with her or with her, with the couple. And we also ask the woman to get a letter from her general practitioner because the general practitioner know the family, know the couple, know the woman for a long time. Therefore, we ask them to get a letter. And in case of any medical issues like overweight, obesity, or heart problem or anything, we also request them to see consultant obstetrician, that is fetal medicine specialist, to go through the risks during pregnancy and delivery and also to the baby because of the age factor and other medical factors. So they understand all this. So we ask for them, uh, arrange for them to see the obstetrician in our clinic because who's attached to our clinic. And then we take their case to ethics committee. Here we represent the case, read the reports of these different people, like the counselor, general practitioner, and the obstetrician and then assess their risk to the woman, risk to the baby, and the whole scenario, like the whole total picture, then we discuss among all these members in our clinic, whether it is right to do the offer the treatment, or is it in her interest not to proceed with the treatment? 
that's what we decide in the ethics committee and if there is no major risk to the mother or the baby then we proceed with the treatment so we have done treatments in the up to the age of 52 53 and we have made women pregnant in fact one of the ladies came for second baby as well and had a second baby and uh, went back so we have done but uh, you know we take each case on individual merits and assess the case and make a decision next question is how many eggs do i have for one cycle so i, I presume the question the person who asked the question meant um how many eggs do i receive in a cycle of egg donation so as dr venkat mentioned it depends on whether you're using first of all fresh or frozen eggs so if you're using frozen eggs we will give you about eight to ten eggs generally if you're using fresh eggs it will depend really if the donor is an egg share donor or an altruistic donor so if it's an egg share donor because you'll be receiving about half of the eggs that she produces we will say that you will receive between five and ten eggs whereas if it's an altruistic donor you may choose to receive only five to ten eggs or you may choose to receive all of the eggs in which case it will likely be between 10 and 20 eggs the next question is is there any restriction on citizenship i'm afraid this is not really a question for us where we just look after the medical side that's something you would need to speak to your solicitor about but if you're from abroad we have no problem treating you um, that doesn't really impact us and treatment in any way the next question is do you have black african donors and i can confidently say that yes we have um, frozen eggs from black african donors and generally there's no waiting time either to find a fresh one we have two donors now going through ready if you want you can come and have the treatment tomorrow okay. so every month we get some black african donors afro caribbean donors right now there are two young girls 26 and 28 uh, they are starting the treatment and uh, you can have and but we also have lots of frozen eggs you know, from the afro-caribbean donors there is no shortage in our case and then the next question is if multiple embryos are obtained could it be frozen for the future yes that's something we recommend because we will generally create more than enough embryos for transfer so as I alluded to earlier, we will transfer between one and two embryos in an egg donation cycle. And generally we will create more embryos than that so that you could come back and use those embryos either for a second pregnancy or if the first attempt is not successful. And then the last question that we have is how much is the treatment? it's difficult to say exactly how much the treatment will cost but i can give you a ballpark estimate so the actual treatment cycle will range between eight and ten thousand pounds depending on the type of donation used and then there will be some workup as well on top of this which will generally be between one and three thousand pounds depending on what exactly is necessary in each case but the best thing to do is actually to speak to either our patient coordinators or the egg donation team to discuss your case in a bit more detail to get a better understanding of what's required and the costs involved so i think those are all the questions that we have for this evening uh, unless there's anything else which i don't believe there is all that remains is for me to thank our panel of speakers. So Dr. Venkat, Darshi and Bijal, thank you very much for um, your presentations this evening. And then last but not least, I would like to thank Georgia and Ashley, who are our technical support for managing and organizing and running this webinar. We couldn't do it without them. So thank you both very much. And um, last but not least, thank you all for attending. We appreciate your time on a Friday evening and um, we wish you all a pleasant evening and a lovely weekend. Thank you. Have a good night.